Hello, this is Lawrence R. Harvey, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. Although, how you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com without your head, I, I, I simply don't know. Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I am Nasty Neil. This is Annabelle Lecter. Yes, and we're proud to be joined by an icon of modern horror film, the man who brought to life Dr. Hyder of Human Centipede, and now Bill Boss of Human Centipede 3, we welcome back to Without Your Head, Dieter Laser. Yeah. Awesome name. It is an awesome name, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The king gods love to, to hear that name, and then they say, awesome. Awesome <laughs> name. <laughs> it, 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 it fits you uh, perfectly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, we were at the premiere with yourself of Human Centipede 3 in Los Angeles. And uh, what was that experience like for you to see the film with an audience of people? And was that your first time seeing the finished part three? Right. I, I hadn't seen the film before, and uh, I was uh, quite excited. But uh, let's say I'm not nervous. I haven't been nervous. I was just uh, excited and full of joy to see it finally. And uh, during shooting, I never ever watch myself or have a glimpse to the screens because uh, a, I have my vision in mind, how far I will throw my acting ball and always to see, oh, on the AD. 80 inches or only 100 inches, I wanted to, uh, to throw a thousand. Uh, that is limiting and uh, it's a hindrance for the fantasy. Therefore, I never watched myself and therefore I had no idea how it would look and how it would, would work. Uh, but anyway, because the work together with Tom is so at ease and so well prepared and every tiny step is together developed uh, in advance, I felt absolutely safe and uh, safe and sound and full of joy. Mm -hmm. You've actually been compared by Tom Six to uh, Klaus Kinski and here's Werner Herzog. How do you feel about that comparison? Yeah, uh, that's a great honor because uh, that was a very impressive actor. But I think he was a little bit, uh, um, let's say, uh, really mental, <laughs> mentally disturbed. <laughs> and uh, I would uh, like to emphasize that... Uh, uh, I'm not one of these people who think they are Napoleon staying in character their whole life as Einstein's or Napoleon's, and they are to be found in mental hospitals. What I do is very calculated. It's very, uh, uh, there are a lot of thoughts behind it, and every minute, every second is a calculation and not just some crazy uh, idiot. <laughs> and and um, Kinski was a guy, uh, you sh uh, should be afraid, you know, uh, he wanted to kill Werner Herzog uh, during the shoot. He, uh, he, was, uh, he was so crazy, he was bad to people, and he was a nasty person because he was so crazy. He really was mentally insane. And uh, that's the only difference. The results of his films are great. He was a great actor, but he was too much in character, in my opinion, because he couldn't, uh, he couldn't distinguish reality, work, and uh, uh, his parts. And therefore, and he was a, a, a nasty diva, so he, he was bad to women, he, he always uh, kicked uh, uh, technicians in the ass, and he behaved very badly, and therefore he is not a role model for me. The only model I have, role model, is myself. That's excellent. So, even all that being said, uh, you do get so into character while you're working. How do you decompress when you're done? How long does it take to get back to Dieter Laser? Oh, that's uh, a switch. That's... Uh, in a second, but uh, during the whole day, staying 
trying to stay in character during the whole day only once and again uh, sometimes i switch it off switch it on again but uh, it's the most uh, uh, important stuff of that is uh, to save energy to be in a standby mode that's all and not to lose energy by chit chats and small talks and so on just to be a little bit more concentrated like a computer on standby so that to go into the part is very fast and uh, i discovered that people don't uh, don't dare to talk to you if you are running around with a re really serious and angry face staring to the floor sitting near the camera people will let you uh, uh, alone mm -hmm. and that's very important for the energy and uh, for to keep the emotions you have gathered for the part and accumulated to keep them on fire so that when you have to to jump that you immediately can use it and not have to to switch between a joke or a small talk or a chit chat and thinking about a woman oh wonderful ass or wonderful legs or look at the tits and then you have to jump into your part and to to avoid that to save energy and be fast uh therefore i in quote i stay in character but at at uh, at the evening uh, when the work is done i'm in between half a second i'm back to the laser but i'm then so full of adrenaline that uh, i will talk you to, uh, talk you under the earth because uh, and then i'm really talkative and don't drive together with me back back to the hotel because you you are dead uh, of my afterwards of my uh, talking uh, because the whole day i, I don't uh, i only do my lines and uh, don't talk a lot so the silence in myself in my system has accumulated to a storm so at, at, in the evening avoid uh, avoid me and don't listen to me because i will joke and talk and uh, make kill you by talking <laughs> that's the only difference and thing in character so it's just uh, it's a tool to work mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, being really comfortable with Tom Six, and was it the same way when you made the first Human Centipede, or do you think working with him on a second movie, it, it strengthened uh, the working relationship between you two? Yeah, uh, you know, I always, um, when, I, when I read the scripts from Tom Six, when I read them both, I'm, the first reaction is, I'm shocked. <laughs> Uh, mostly he tells me the story and then I'm excited because he is such a wonderful storyteller. You see everything, you see every, every scene and you go home excited. First film, we had, uh, uh, we had a wonderful meeting in Berlin. He told me everything. Second, this, the third part, we met in London and he told me the whole story wonderfully. And then the long, long time, uh, pre-production time starts. And then uh, the, the story he told you is working in your system. And then w finally, the, the uh, final draft of the script arrives at home. And in both cases, I was shocked reading the script. And with part third, Three, I, I thought, oh, no, 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 that's impossible. I can't eat clitorises. That's impossible. I won't rape a, a, a woman in a coma. Uh, impossible. So the 100% political uh, incorrectness, that uh, shocked me 100%. So I reacted uh, like a good audience for Tom Six films. And uh, in, in the, with part three, I was so shocked that I said, no, Tom, I can't play that. And I started to refuse to, to play the part. Mm -hmm. And thank God, 
thank Tom Six on my knees. He didn't give up. He tried to convince me, but he didn't change as, uh, uh, nothing. He didn't change anything in the, in the script, but he didn't give up uh, to convince me. And finally, in a four hours meeting at the airport from Amsterdam, uh, in the Sheraton restaurant there, he managed to show me, to open my eyes and to convince me and to show me the comedy in it. I, by the 100% political incorrectness, I couldn't, in German stubborn way, I couldn't realize the comedy in it. I took it 100% seriously. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> then he opened my eyes, and then the fun started. Then we developed together the pot. And we did that in a wonderful manner because we said, this table where you managed to convince me is now our meeting point. And always when I had a new idea or Tom had a new change in the script, then we met in Amsterdam airport, Sheraton restaurant, same table, same time, and worked together on the park. And uh, as it is with me, I can't stop myself, so I jump up and uh, or go down to the floor and play for Tom in the restaurant <laughs> at the table. I call that the Sheraton table dancing. I played him my scenes uh, and offered him different versions so that he can cho could choose and say, ah, I prefer this way or that way. So some guests sometimes looked very worried and a little <laughs> bit anxious to our table. And it even happened that people came to the table and asked Tom if they could be of some help because <laughs> they saw a crazy guy uh, behaving very strange, talking very strange uh, stuff. And uh, this ritual and this working method was wonderful. So... Uh, I always would recommend for a young actor go to the airport of Amsterdam, sit on the table on a table in the restaurant of the Sheraton Hotel, and talk there with your directors. You will be uh, will be feel great. And uh, so these meetings in Amsterdam and this uh, table dancing made our connection even stronger. And uh, we were so well prepared when we started to shoot that we did the whole shooting between us was actually, you could say, without any words. Because we knew everything what we wanted. He knew what I, what I, how I would play it, and I knew precisely what he wanted. So we only, Tom and me, at night, when we finished the day's work, we uh, sat together with the cameraman, and I, or Tom, or both, we told him what we would, how I would uh, do it the next day. So a short professional arrangement with the camera, with the DOP, that was enough. And uh, because of our working relationship, Tom is the only director where I can manage that I very, very often to do things in one shot, with one clap. And we try to avoid any rehearsal because the vibration of the first shot is very precious. If you do the third or tenth shot, always the same stuff, there is something, something is losing. It's too, sometimes too perfect or, uh, yeah, too calculated. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we love to, sh to do it in one clap. Mm -hmm. You lose the spontaneity. Absolutely. We, we want to use that in every shot. And sometimes uh, Tom has a very good feeling we are doing a scene and he's waiting. And uh, the scene is done. And he still is waiting because he, he knows sometimes it happened to me that suddenly I have an, have a, an additional, uh, additional idea uh, out of the moment. 
And that happened, uh, you, you might remember when I, uh, after the castration scene, I uh, washed my head in blood. Mm -hmm. That yes. was a spontaneous action, and the scene was already done, and suddenly I did that. I didn't know it will happen, but it happened. And thank God, Tom is so smart and knows me so well that he just waited long enough and suddenly I did that. Dieter, I'd just like to say that that is, uh, and we were doing the review the other day, that is actually my favorite scene in the movie and wanted to ask if that was something you came up with or not. Because it just seems for that character, that moment is the absolute highlight in his power, where he really is so raw in his emotion, that's just absolutely, the key. Absolutely, yes. He has, uh, that's the victory over his enemy, the blood of his enemy, to have to wash his face in it, his head in it. I call it the snake head, because Tom, and, Tom very early said to me, always think about the desert. And uh, I have, uh, at home here, I have a, a snake picture, the profile of a desert snake, and uh, that inspired me a lot. And uh, the bold, bold head is uh, as well in the direction of a snake in the desert, uh, because the goal of Tom and me is to go beyond, to go far beyond a normal character, a normal, realistic uh, guy. Our goal was from the scratch to go as far as possible over the top, to go as cartoonish and a comic strip like as possible uh, over beyond every boundary. So it's more in my vision. And our goal was to create more a creature than a human being. And so you can say it's the... Uh, the desert snake of evil in the disguise or in the form of a warden. And uh, this comic strip, uh, I, I could see at the premiere, and I was very satisfied uh, because I first time saw if I have reached my vision or not. And same, uh, Tom... Uh, and Tom already knew that. He said to me, you did it, my friend. <laughs> now, you know, you talk about uh, the comedy in the film. And yeah. w uh, w when you're acting, do you have that in mind that uh, you're, do you act differently for a comedy? Or do you leave that more up to the editing and the direction of uh, the filmmaker? If you take it 100% serious, what you are doing, mm -hmm. and at the same time, push it to the most radical possibility, to the most radical point, uh, to the end of the storytelling of this moment, then you don't have to care if it's funny or not, because you don't, uh, I don't do it uh, to be funny, uh, as well, um, the same thing that I don't act a scene to be good or to be loved or something like that. My goal and Tom's goal is to tell a story as far as possible to get it to a point where we say you can't go further. And uh, the, the, the main guidance and the main motivation is storytelling. Storytelling to a point which I would like to see it and to a point how I would like to see it and how Tom would like to see it. And we don't care, left or right, uh, what other people say or think because we are not so special that you can, cannot reckon it out that uh, there has to be a lot of people with the same taste and the same... Uh, uh, preferences uh, in the world than we both are. So there's an, th th there are the fans, there are the audience who like these kind of this kind of storytelling, and we therefore we give a shit if the critics are bad as they are. Uh, if the critics are good, I say, oh, wonderful! They are so clever, they are so smart, they are good critics fantastic guys, they really know what storytelling is, 
And if the critics are bad, I say they are just stupid. They didn't understand one thing. <laughs> uh, in watching the film, I yeah. noticed that there are times when, in particular, your performance feels almost more like a, a stage performance where you would be in a live theater with a live audience. Do you agree with that? And what do you think? Yeah, of the yeah as, I, as I said, uh, the goal was from the scratch to go over the top. So, it, it, uh, and if you say, uh, if I say I'm a cartoonish pe uh, person, so every morning in the makeup I say, do my eyelashes more than any hooker, hooker would dare to uh, do. Uh, make my face as thick with a layout of, of uh, makeup as possible and shave my head as smooth as, as possible because I want to go over the top. So uh, if you feel that's a, a kind of stage uh, performance or theatrical performance, yeah, sure, every cartoon is big theater and every comic strip is big theater and is too much. And that's my goal for this part from the scratch. Same with Dr. Heiter. He is also in another way, in, in a very different way. He is also a cartoon figure for me. It's cartoonish, and uh, it's by purpose the too much dyed hair of uh, Dr. Heiter, together with his 1930 uh, doctor's coat. That's, for me, it's, it's like a drawing. It's, it's like a, a comic strip uh, character, mm -hmm. and that's uh, the goal from the scratch. And uh, that sometimes shocks you, sometimes you are afraid to see that, and sometimes you have to laugh. And both is, is precisely the goal. And uh, with part three, it's so over the top, and uh, it's the, it was from, from the scratch, the wish of Tom that he said, he's always too loud, he's unnerving, he is an asshole, he's stupid, he is... Uh, just a complete idiot. And uh, that's what we tried to reach, and we reached it. And I said, uh, let him make him, him uh, a German, uh, then he will have the same bad accent, which you can hear <laughs> now live. And uh, let, him, let him be the, 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 the child of uh, pig farmers and f uh, coming from Schweinfurt so that I could care a shit about my accent. And uh, the thickest possible German stupid idiotic accent, uh, that's what I wanted to have and I reached that. Uh, some people in some moments of at the first few uh, can't even understand some, even me. I couldn't <laughs> understand some, some sentences. For example, I hate human beings into the uh, uh, bucket. Uh, I had to think it over and over and again. What did he say? What did he say then? And uh, slowly I uh, in, uh, thought, ah, yeah, I hate human beings. It must have been. So that's uh, the stuff. And uh, luckily, I, the reactions of the fans, which I read, they are beautiful. Is it strange for you to have people love your villains? Because they are, this one in particular, is pretty disgusting. I mean, I've used the word vile over and over to describe Bill Boss. So is that strange yeah. when people actually like that character? Uh, that's the, that's the, uh, the strange thing. Uh, when I saw part two the first time, uh, and I didn't know Lawrence at all, and I saw the, that film the first time, in the end, I loved that monster. And uh, even though I, I was disgusted what he was doing and uh, about his character, I was disgusted, but I loved Lawrence. And when I met him, I loved him even more because he's such a sweet man uh -huh. and uh, such a nice guy. Mm, and I think even the, the baddest uh, 
guy in the world. It's uh, done qu qu quite well. Then in the end, there is part in your uh, part of uh, in your recognition. You like him in a way. That all bad uh, all bad characters in in the end have a little sympathy for the devil. I would say. I know you'd said in one interview that uh, when you went into the role, you thought of him as a hurt child, which I thought was right. very interesting. Yes, that's, uh, you know, nobody is born like that. And even though I say it's more a creature for, uh, out of the Bible, uh, coming from another black heaven, let's say a um, kind of a, a fallen angel, uh, no, no human being is born uh, like these as this asshole Bill Boss. Uh, therefore, the only reason uh, for this behavior or this uh, appearance can be only that he is one time in his life, let's say two years old, one year old, must have been hurt very, very much. And uh, to learn from his grandfathers how to castrate pigs and then do it later on, uh, decades later in a prison to uh, another human being, that must be something in his earliest childhood which disturbed, destroyed his soul. Mm. And that always, in every scene, I have that in mind, I have that in mind uh, during playing the scenes. And I had another, I had the snake, I had the child, the hurt child, which is only coming out nasty, shouting, crying, uh, idiotic, a mean, mean child, a snake from the desert. My third uh, picture in my, in, my, in my inner system for the part was uh, a very famous designer in Germany, who is totally artificial. He's, he has had surgery in his face a hundred times about. So he just looks like no human being anymore. And this guy is full of jewelry. He is uh, wonderfully dressed and t t totally crazy. And that he must be hurt, have been hurt as a very as a child, in my opinion, is it's only to be speedy, to to be recognized by his breathing, and therefore, if you see the film mm, sent to three about four or five times, you will discover that the breathing of the boss is uh, irritated. He can say, I don't want to, huh? I exaggerate a little bit uh, with this filmmaker. Therefore, he is uh, even the, the stretching out of my pronunciation is so exaggerated because his breathing is not normal. And in very often, you can discover people who have had a very this drawing disturbing childhood they breathe different they are not at ease with, with, with their breathing and that's the with the boss he's always on the edge of getting air and therefore and he, he, together with that permanent shouting and being loud there's always a lack of air Something else I noticed about the Bill Boss character is his obsession with his health. He's checking out his heart rate. He goes to the doctors, says he doesn't want bad news. What do you think about that aspect of the character? Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Mm, because I, I'm, I'm the contrary. I don't care. And uh, all this checking checking uh, your health status and your blood pressure seems to me that there is if uh, he is a, he is as you see in other scenes he is a total coward 
and he is afraid. And uh, as as such a chicken as he is, he always uh, he is even afraid uh, of a heart attack, of blood pressure, and everything. So he feels unsafe. He feels uncertain and. Uh, always measuring his blood pressure and going to the doctor and so on and so forth, uh, is, in addition shows his cowardice and his weakness. Because a big part of the role is pretending. He pretends to be strong. He pretends to, to, to have power. But he is a chicken. He is really a, a coward, but what you can see when he when he is shouting and crying, I want respect, I want respect. You can't be weaker than that. Mm-hmm. Now, earlier, you mentioned uh, Lawrence Harvey and Human Centipede Part 2, and I just wondered, what did you think of that movie and the fact that they referenced uh, your movie as a movie? Yeah. Uh, as I told you already, I'm a sissy, and I'm afraid of bodily, bodily flu, uh, fluids, mm-hmm. and uh, therefore uh, I'm the best audience for Tom Six films. I'm shocked, always, very, very easily shocked. But uh, on the other hand, I love his art so much. When I see, I love the black and white. I love the, mm, the black and white where... Even the rain looks like like blood, and uh, I love the qu- quotations of Psycho and uh, of Mr. Sigmund Freud and uh, the jokes in it, and uh, the the camera, the the framing. I love everything, and there's one moment which I love most in that film when Lawrence takes a, 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 a sniff out of his uh, breathing tool, um, there's suddenly, for a couple of seconds, the atmosphere is gone, and it's a dead picture. And I love that moment very much. And uh, altogether, it's, for me, it's a, a great piece of art, and uh, after seeing it the first time, I said to Tom, it's a slaughterhouse, the world as a slaughterhouse in a nutshell. Mm-hmm. And that's precisely what his films are about. Uh, all three films are for me political, very political films. And uh, the slaughterhouse, we are living in a slaughterhouse and we think we are safe. We are saved or we are certain, but we can't be like that because we, we know what ISIS is doing. We know what's coming up. We know which uh, fights we will have about water, about food, about population and immigrants and everything and refugees. And we will, we are living in hell and don't know it. Or we know it every night uh, watching the TV, we see the, the hell, the pictures from the hell, the pictures of evil. And, uh, but uh, we think we are safe. We are not safe. We are in big, big, in great danger. And therefore, these films are pictures who show, show us where we live. It's interesting that each villain is seeking not only to be powerful, but it's, it's almost a matter of finding their own safety, even though they're the ones who are villainous. Yes. Safety, love, and uh, yeah, safety and love. They seek. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, they are like, for me, they are like animals. And uh, they don't know that they are bad. Shaving in the morning, the SS guy, the Nazi, Nazi criminal says to himself, oh, what I'm doing for my country, I can't tell that to my children. I'm standing in blood up to my hips. But uh, what I do is so 
so great. So the, you, nobody is shaving himself and saying, what a bad guy am I? Yeah. They love each of themselves. They think they are good and they do as a lot as, as much self-talk as possible to convince themselves that they are not bad. And, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of people have no po other possibility to, than to behave bad uh, as a cry of love, for love. Mm -hmm. Some do suicide as a cry for love. Some kill other people as a cry for love. But uh, they are all human beings which were born to be loved and to love. Mm -hmm. they, and we lose that because uh, we, will, we get hurt in our childhood and we, we lose track uh, for what we have once uh, been built or what are the, the purpose for our existence. We lose that because we have a little drug factory between our shoulders and we don't, we are not able to handle the animal and the, the brains. We can't get that together. Mm -hmm. uh, we are still wild animals and on the other hand, we are civilized persons uh, with an education and uh, it still doesn't fit together. Mm -hmm. I watch a really uh, interesting video interview with you and Tom Six and Lawrence Harvey, and uh, you'd mentioned that you thought it was kind of a fallacy about the Nazis, where they were all just doing, uh, just obeying orders, and that you said you think they all were evil and actually loved being evil. And do you see that in the movie where your character is clearly evil, but like uh, Dwight? and the doctor, and eventually uh, the governor, they all get behind the idea of doing evil and actually quite enjoy it. Yeah, actually quite enjoy it. I, I, I think that's, that's right. Uh, uh, what I meant in that interview is that uh, after the war, Second World War II, uh, the whole society behaved as nothing had happened and you know in may the war was over and germany was defeated and already in june august uh, people said now uh, now it, it's enough uh, to talk about uh, the past uh, they they all behaved as nothing had happened they had killed, uh, you know, as everybody knows, they had killed six million Jews, and uh, the whole society did behave like nothing had happened. And these guys, there, there have been enough guys who had immigrated to America or uh, left Germany early enough, and some people died because they didn't obey, but uh, the the population, the, the nation, the German nation stood behind that criminal Hitler and they laughed in a way because we are, we are dangerous. The most, Bertolt Brecht says that human beings are the most dangerous animal in the world. And that's really true. And we never know if I would have been born earlier, maybe I would have ended as a commandant from Auschwitz. I don't know. What, what would happen with me because we are not safe. We are not safe uh, to be healthy in our brains because I studied for one part. I, I went to uh, uh, a mental hospital and uh, studied uh, schizophrenic people and they told me in the most normal uh, tone, uh, you know, it happened on April 17th. I took my, some perfume behind my ears and then it started. And uh, since then, I don't feel my legs anymore. And the doctors say I'm, I'm mentally ill, but uh, what shall I do? I don't feel it. You were talking about 
yeah. love and people seeking love and being afraid, do you feel that there is a, a sense of real empowerment for the people following a leader such as Hitler? And that's a huge reason why people will actually do things that are horrible because then they have that sense of empowerment, which is almost like feeling love. I only can say you, you are right. You are absolutely right. I think so. that's true. Which role was uh, harder for you to, uh, to grasp? Uh, the Dr. Hyder or the Bill Boss? Which one was harder, you know, to get into? Uh, let's say there's not a big difference. Uh, after I had discovered uh, the possibility to um, create a cartoonish uh, fascist uh, like a modern Dr. Mengele, mm -hmm. then I had no problems with the script anymore. I could, that was my uh, vehicle uh, to create a modern uh, neo-Nazi doctor in the with a in a drawing which resembles Dr. Mengele from Auschwitz, uh, the angel of death. Then after I caught that idea and after Tom said, yeah, that's what I meant, then I had no problems at all. Same procedure with uh, part three. After Tom showed me the comedy in it, and uh, I, I, got, uh, I, I started myself to laugh by reading the script, <laughs> then I had no problem anymore. Uh, and I had to find that, that vehicle, that uh, what I told about you already, that uh, um, motivations, the snake, the child, the nasty child, the snake, and uh, yeah, then I had no, after creating these tools and the breathing problems, uh, after I had caught these ideas and developed them together with Tom, then I had no problems at all, and uh, the second shooting was uh, even more at ease and relaxed and without rehearsals and without uh, with discussions. It went absolutely smoothly mm -hmm. and was real fun and joy to do it. Every day uh, I felt blessed doing the work and uh, every day we came together for work again. And uh, mm, you know what is so beautiful with Tom is he <laughs> directs the most brutal scenes, but at the set, the atmosphere is uh, as smooth and as tender uh, you wouldn't imagine. Uh, and the more, the more brutal the scenes are, the more polite we are behave together. And uh, for example, in part one, the centipede itself, uh, it was taken so much care about the centipede. They never have been on, on their knees longer than five, five to seven minutes, three to seven minutes maximum. And uh, the tips of the girls never were watched uh, at, so we, we looked upward until the centipede was settled and then we, we only watched them during uh, the shoot. So um, it's very strange. Tom is a very, very um, nice, gentle man. And uh, we have, at the set, we have a very tender atmosphere. I know you, uh, during the Q&A after, um, after the screening in L.A., you talked a lot about Brie Olson and how uh, great you thought it was to work with her. Um, it's like to, uh, to capture some thoughts that you have of working with Brie Olson on part three. Yes, I love to work with her because I love uh, female, ac uh, I love actresses who are pals, who are partners, 
where, where you don't have to think uh, about the difference male or female. Mm -hmm. And uh, Brie is, uh, is a real worker. She's a professional, very nice person, and very, very straight. And I love that, because sometimes as an actor you have the difficulties that the, the actresses are delicate and uh, very complicated and you have to watch it and don't touch me too, too, too tight and uh, think of that and this. And she has no uh, diva stuff. She's just a good worker, very professional, very good actress. And uh, it's... it's uh, it's fun to work with her, and uh, I love that because you only have to have uh, short professional uh, arrangements together, and then it works without words. Uh, another guy I really uh, was impressed by in the film was uh, Robert Lasorda, and uh, you guys had a lot of great interaction uh, uh, together. Uh, what are your thoughts of, on uh, on Robert as an actor? Yes. Robert is a very, very strong actor. And uh, you see, there's one point I, I, I congratulated him already on stage because we stood uh, nearby uh, after the performance, after the screening. And uh, it sounds strange, but uh, there's one little moment in the film when he is jumping down from a table. Mm -hmm. And he does it uh, in a special way. And I s said to, to Robert, this moment, this tiny moment for a pro or for an actor, actor's colleague, it shows what a good actor you are. Because to be able, so impressive with such a powerful vibration, just to, to jump from a table, uh, that's a really... Uh, a, a, a very fine act, actor's skill and shows how much power he has. And uh, in this case, uh, Robert, from the scratch, when we met first, I said to him, because you are my counterpart, uh, you are my the most dangerous enemy in the film for me, for Ward and the boss. Uh, therefore, don't... Uh, don't be astonished when I don't greet you or when I don't have eye contact with you because I want to, to keep that precious uh, uh, thing only for our scenes. So we hardly talked during the shoot. And he understood completely and immediately. And that uh, uh, belongs to the department uh, staying in character. Uh, similar to that uh, I avoided in part one to um, come close uh, to the centipede actors because I thought for, Bill, for Dr. Heiter, these, these three guys are a centipede, an insect. They are not human beings. Like the Nazis said, subhuman. They are subhuman. They are less, in a way, less than a pet. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, we had very little social contact that helped me for Dr. Heiter and not to like them too much and vice versa. And that same technique I had with Robert. So we, we avoided, in a way, uh, to, to come too close during the shoot. We had uh, dinner with Akihiro and uh, and interviewed him before, and he he talked about the scene where you go to uh, kick him in the first film, and he thought you got too close, and you and you could tell he was animated where it still he still had some emotion about about that, but do you think that actually helped the film that you guys did have that tension between each other, between you and, and Akihiro oh, in the first movie? Oh, that's, uh, Ak Aki, that, uh, we never had any tension only once. Uh -huh. We had a, we had a, we had a, uh, a I will tell you, um, we had a kind of, of really intense, tense, intense fight, uh -huh. but that was all my fault. Uh, the, the reason was, I had with my naked foot, I had to kick him in the face in the scene. And we had a safety distance for the camera 
an arrangement about, let's say, four, four feet, about two meters dis uh, safety distance to the ca for the camera so that it looks uh, quite good. But when, we sh when, we, uh, when the camera was rolling, with all the bad films I have seen in my life, in my mind, I thought, oh, I will uh, shorten it down to, let's say, one meter only. Mm -hmm. be because to, to be safe and to be sure, it would look very good. So I did it with uh, that shortened distance, and Aki immediately interrupted and, and shouted, safety first, safety first. And I said, chicken shit. <laughs> and then I thought, this kamikaze will kill me now, <laughs> because he's really angry. Mm -hmm. But Lady Ilona, always smart and always alert, immediately shouted, break, we have a break. <laughs> and I went to my wardrobe, as I always do, uh, to be alone. And sitting in my wardrobe, uh, I thought, uh, if Aki doesn't feel safe, my dear friend Peter, you have to accept that. And then I went out and looked where the other guys were, and they were all uh, gathered in the makeup room, the whole staff, and all the other actors, and I officially and openly uh, apologized to Aki, and he accepted that. Mm -hmm. And that uh, event made our relationship and uh, mutual respect even m much stronger. So uh, that was a very productive event. During the, the time before you weren't involved in Part 3, and then, you know, eventually when you were, uh, there was a lot of stuff on the internet that Udo Kier was going to take over that role. Do you know how serious those talks were of that actually happening? I have no idea. I don't believe it. I only know that I said I, I won't play it because of what I already explained. And... Uh, that uh, Tom didn't give up to convince me. Mm -hmm. If there really, really was uh, s uh, some talks to Udo Kier, I have no idea, and I don't care because uh, <laughs> it's, it's totally um, boring for me to think about that. Right. Uh, you know, because I said I won't play it, maybe uh, it would have been the right from Tom and Ilona to talk to other actors, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know if that, if that really happened because the only thing I know was that they always tried to uh, change my mind. Mm -hmm. And they managed that and I'm really, as I said, I'm very thankful to Tom that uh, he tried and never give, gave up to convince me and to change my mind. And uh, I'm I'm really thankful for that. Yeah. How is uh How did Human Centipede itself, the movie or the movies, how have they changed Dieter Laser's life? I'm I'm not a fan of of normal horror films mm -hmm. because uh, let's say I haven't been a fan, and I never would have uh, thought uh, that one day I would play in horror films. But now I'm after that two times with Tom. I'm addicted, and I'm eagerly waiting already for our next work uh, because I love so much to work with them. And uh, yeah, I love. And, and I was astonished uh, about the horror family. What sweet people the audience is. Mm -hmm. The fans of the horror films are so nice people. I I met a lot of them uh, during the uh, Texas Frightmare weekend, and uh, I was so it was so sweet with these uh, community. And uh, what I get on Facebook and what I see on Twitter, uh, I love these people who who are horror fans. I never would have imagined that before, and um, I decided to continue. Uh, in that uh, realm, uh, in that kind of film, and uh, um, I 
I would be an idiot uh, because Tom, Ilona, and I, we are dream team, uh, not to continue our work. And we will become better and better and better and even more shocking, more shocking, more shocking, and more over the top. That So you have to watch it because one day you uh, have to be afraid that the cinema will explode because the screen is so <laughs> strong. Because you see the fifth uh, Tom Six film with Dieter Laser and uh, you have to be have security with you when you are going into the cinema. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to be involved with this person who really respects your integrity as an artist, where it seems like, of course, you want a specific reaction from an audience, but it does feel it's much more about making a product that you believe in than getting giant box office sales and being on every screen and around the world. Yeah. That's the most important thing that you are convinced because in a way it happens to you if you are worldwide recognized or not. Uh, uh, as an artist, you would be lost if you, think, uh, if you think it's a question of fame. It's a question of passion. And maybe you write the best novel in the world and uh, after you are dead, they will discover it or not. Maybe you will be the best painter in the world and never sell one picture. So all these great artists in, in the world, they are fighting for, uh, for their, their art. And that is really satisfying, uh, whatever you do. But um, to work and live for your own fame, I think that's pretty exhausting and pretty boring, it must be. Now you said uh, obviously you would like to work with uh, with Tom Moore and Alona. Um, would you like to do uh, different roles? And would you, if they did come up with an idea f to revisit Human Centipede in a fourth film, would you be interested, uh, or would it depend really on what the idea was? I have I have no idea uh, how and what uh, Tom Six's next plans are. Mm -hmm. The only thing I know that we three. Uh, as I call them, Sir Tom, Lady Ilona, and me, that we said we will badly con wish to continue our work, and we will continue our work, work because we were silly uh, if we wouldn't work, uh, uh, if we wouldn't continue. Uh, it's too precious, just, this relationship. And on the other hand, you know, I have a, I have played uh, in, in so much theater plays and so so many Euro European and German films um, that this horror film experience is completely new for me and very exciting. And to be honest, it's uh, also a question of my my tender age. I don't. I'm, I think it's boring to play play for me. It's boring to play grandpas with a uh, with a um, um, candy bar for <laughs> their in their hands for their grandchildren. I want to to have a gun in my hand, at least a gun, and uh, to play the the evil because the evil is ageless, and I can play with 150 years. I can play evil creatures. That doesn't matter. But grandpas are limited. Grandpas can be played only until, let's say, a hundred years. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there's definitely a, a special bond between the three of you, and you guys work so well together, the three of you. But have you got a lot of offers from other like uh, horror um, filmmakers that want you uh, in in their projects? I had a lot of offers. Uh, uh, after um, Dr. Heiter, after the first part, mm -hmm. and I must tell you, I all uh, about I think about what say about twelve to fifteen offers for horror films I got, and I turned them all down because I didn't like the script. And my luxury is since I'm uh, started as a very young actor, I never ever did my whole life stuff I was con convinced about. Uh, so I turned them all down. And 
The last horror offer I, I turned down was, I think, Frankenstein's uh, army. Mm. And uh, now I'm waiting what will happen after part three. But uh, we will see. It was a really good decision to turn down Frankenstein's <laughs> I, army. I was thinking the, the exact same thing. I wasn't going <laughs> to say it. It's but, very yeah. bad. You made the right decision on, on that one. Yeah, yeah. But you never know that bef beforehand. Exactly. Because, for example, I, I turned down a couple of years ago, I turned down an Italian film because I didn't like the script. And afterwards, when I saw the result of the film, it was such a good film. And I was so angry about myself that I turned it down. Uh, because you never, you can never say for sure that will become bad. So, um, but you have to do your mistakes. Mm -hmm. And maybe sometimes uh, you turn down uh, good stuff because uh, it will appear better than you, than you think. Yeah. But, you know, that's life. Along those lines, do you think um, because Tom was so... Um, adamant about you, you know, being in the third movie and was so confident that, you know, he didn't want to change anything in the script. If he wasn't, if he wasn't that kind of person, you might have just said, oh, I'm not doing this and it never would have went anywhere. But because of his confidence, do you think that helped your decision to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do part three? Yeah, you know, every normal director would have said, uh, uh-huh. He doesn't like the script. He refuses to, to, to play it. Uh, so forget him. And uh, you would have seen maybe it would have been Udo Kier or whoever. Or Tom Hanks or whoever who would play it. Uh, <laughs> uh. But uh, um, that's the quality of, of Tom. That he, he didn't give up. And he never gives up. He is, uh, that's... Uh, in this point, we are quite similar because uh, we don't we don't uh, look as I always say we don't look left or right. We do just do our thing. And he wanted me for part one, and he wanted me for part three, and then he is stubborn, and then he fights, and then he never gives up. And that's one of his great qualities, and therefore one reason more to love him. After, uh, after your experience with three, do you feel that now you really can trust Tom's decisions and instead of him coming to you and you see something horrific and you, and you question it and don't even want to do it, now uh, do you feel much more comfortable and free to just, not that you'll oh no, just think, not pay attention, but... Uh, I think the next script uh, I will get from Tom, I will be shocked to the bones. I will be afraid... <laughs> I will be a sissy and we will, we will be anxious. And then Tom will tell me and sit together with me, or I will find an idea in the script because his scripts are really rich. The, only the surface has to be just entertainment, but beneath there's a lot of stuff. For example, I never would have come to the idea of Dr. Mengele, even would have... Uh, then to read in script for the for part one for Dr. Heiter that he formerly in his former life uh, had separated Siamese twins and now he's connecting people together. And this second layer of the script slowly told me, A, 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 who was it who experimented with twins? And I came to Mengele. And when I called uh, Tom and I said, Tom, may I call him Joseph, Meng Joseph in, uh, as a recall to Mengele, he said, now you got me. And that will be with the next script, the same procedure. I will first be like the audience, shocked and fascinated. And then in the next step, discovering the next layer or uh, being open. Uh, or Tom opening my eyes for another aspect, then it will work. But you always need me, at least I. I always need a vehicle, as I say, or a bicycle to 
to roll or drive through the story. And I have to be totally convinced. And uh, therefore, it took some time to be convinced uh, how to play uh, the boss. And maybe we will have the next, the uh, next time we will have the same pattern or it uh, goes even f faster or s more swiftly uh, to come to the telling point. Because as I said, storytelling is uh, the main motivation and you have to be convinced what you tell to other people. And therefore, that's what uh, fans often feel that uh, there is a mind behind it who wants to give something from the inner, inner landscape, from uh, the person, from the center of, of the person. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you said, you know, there was some scenes when you read the script that you thought, you know, I don't want to do this. And then once you found the humor, you were cool with them. Uh, but when you're actually filming the scenes, what specific scenes for you were the hardest to actually film? Uh, they were all as easy and as smooth and at ease to shoot. Uh, there were no problems at all. Because we, we had rehearsed that all in, in the restaurant of Amsterdam. We had, uh, we had uh, the same goals, so we just had to do it. It was, it was ready, and therefore no problems at all. The only thing I had in part one was when I had to say, uh, um, uh, what was the line? Swallow it, swallow it. <laughs> swallow it, bitch. Uh, feed her, feed her. Yeah. Then suddenly, like reading the first time of the script, I saw the shit flow from <laughs> ass to mouth in my mind's eye during playing the scene. And I was suddenly really, I had a, had a block. And uh, mm, this line in part one comes out so nicely aggressive because that was my way to overcome my block and uh, to switch from the point of view of the audience back into Dr. Heiter. And therefore, uh, it's so aggressive. Theta, theta. Uh, that was my way to overcome this moment. But that was in both films the only moment I had suddenly uh, a blockage. Mm -hmm. uh, a question about Dr. Hyder and Bill Boss. Uh, do you think, because I've been thinking about these two characters, that they are polarities of the same personality? That you have Dr. Hyder, who's been a very successful man, and then you have Bill Boss, who's a warden, so he's achieved something, but he's very weak. Yeah. Yeah, you could see it that way. Two extremes of the same coin, mm -hmm. two sides of the same coin that mm, one could say that, yes? Uh, what did you think of uh, Tom Six as an actor? Oh, I loved it. I liked that very much. Uh -huh. I think he, he did a very good job. But no one else could have played Tom Six besides Tom Six. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And when he's vomiting, and I, li I like that that confident smile when he when he comes I I to the prison. Prison. Uh, he always comes with that beautiful smile and uh, with that aura which he has uh, uh, even in private life. Um, the aura of a dandy. Uh, I mean it in a classical uh, version. I always say there are only two real dandies left on earth. And that is Karl Lagerfeld and Tom Six. And uh, uh, yes, I loved, his, I loved his appearance in the film. Uh -huh. There was something he said um, in the Q&A, which uh, really like resonated with me, was he said some people will you know, choose a star in movies that... Uh, Maybe they'll get more money for, will be seen by more that weekend, but then no one will remember. But these movies will always be remembered. And do you ever, uh, does that ever 
go in your do you ever think about that the legacy of the human centipede movies and after you know everyone listening to the show's gone that these movies will still be seen and be talked about by people uh as long as they watch films yeah i think these films will survive very long they will they will be in a couple of years they will be in every university as classics and they still will be on the classic shelves in the supermarkets. Um, <laughs> that's funny, because I'd, I'd mentioned that too, that this is, it's not, in my opinion, it's not really a horror. Well, like you were saying, it's, it's not a typical horror movie. This isn't Nightmare on Elm Street with a guy with a bunch of knives lashing out. Uh, but it's yeah, not... Sure. But it's not quite a... It's, it's, these are all three are for me political, uh, very, uh, very black political comedies. All three films for me. Mm -hmm. My thought is that you can't really put them on the shelf with comedies or horror movies. You just have to have Tom Six films, <laughs> and that's the section okay. you go to. I, I built a uh, Tom Six University. Where on the classic shelf, all the films are <laughs> from six. Uh -huh. And a supermarket franchise, which uh, is called the Tom Six Fruit Machine. And there you also will find all the films of Tom Six. Mm -hmm. what, what can we eat from a Tom Six supermarket? <laughs> that's, that's a concern. I think vegan. Only vegan. <laughs> really? Is he vegan? No. Okay. <laughs> no I, was... I was thinking, I can't but imagine him, him, but Tom's full of surprises. About, uh, the, 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 uh, thinking about the uh, one digestive tract from the centipede uh, insects, uh, then I would say mm, give, give, them, give them only vegetables because uh, that seems uh, to be the, the cleanest version of uh, food. Very true. But at least it, it has to be organic food, mm -hmm. I think. So that's good. Do you think that uh, part three takes the stance of um, that we should be uh, treat our prisoners better or that this is the way maybe we should treat our prisoners? No, I think that that's uh, just a... It, it's more about a career. How we can can a bad guy make a political or official career in a system? Mm -hmm. Then I think the centipede stuff for the prisoners is not so important. It's just a very very good joke, uh, uh, and uh, for all God like figures like Dr. Heiter, Hitler, or Bill Boss, or whoever, they want uh, to... Uh, Dr. Heiter would, would, can rest in peace only that day when uh, the whole human mankind, when mankind is one, one big, big centipede. So Heiter is still not at uh, resting in peace because what's a prison compared with all the Chinese people you could combine? So I would say uh, that's uh, the main thing, uh, the political story is how can a bad ass make a career, career, and it's a happy ending. He has, he has, uh, he's a winner, Bill Boss. Mm -hmm. And that's more important than the, the, the prison system. Nobody's thinking, uh, that that's a, a practical uh, idea, or uh, it's it's criticism for for the prison system in America. It's just a very black black joke in my eyes. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny because Tom had has said uh, whether or not it's true or not. I assume it is that the original idea for Human Centipede came from the uh, the idea of sowing uh, heinous criminals. I believe you said pedophiles. Specifically. Pedophiles to the asses of truck yeah. drivers. Yeah, he very early said that uh, he saw with friends uh, something in television, on television about uh, uh, pedophile criminals. And he said 
as a joke, he said, you should sue uh, uh, these guys to the ass, this guy. I think it was one guy, about one guy, who had done terrible things uh, to the ass of a truck driver. And that's, let's say, um, uh, just a joke between friends uh, watching together something on TV. But uh, then, he, then he told, said that uh, over the over a long, longer time, he suddenly thought maybe that's the first idea for maybe an interesting film. So, uh, but to say now his first idea was that, and therefore he means it seriously with the prisoners, uh, I think that's too far, a, a jump too far. Uh, done. Uh, I don't know. I, he he could tell you the truth. I don't know mm -hmm. uh, uh, because I never asked him. Of uh, is it really your idea or something like that? I never asked him about that because, uh, as you know, we don't need many words to understand each other. And uh, I never had the idea that uh, that's a serious idea to to punish prisoners like that. Mm -hmm. That's too realistic. Uh, as I always say, it's a comic strip. And uh, there's always a, a little bit truth in everything, but um, the metaphor or the metaphor of, of that uh, 500 centipede is, uh, is, for me, is not so important. Mm -hmm. It does show, though, um, even though... The we talk about the comedic aspect that things like this, it's not too far off what happened with Nazis in power so that there could be this idea of history repeating itself because if human beings did it before, they can certainly do it again. Yeah. Let's say it's, it's a picture. It's an image for an ideology. The Nazi said, uh, Special kinds of the population, special people are not human beings, and to kill them easier, and to treat them bad, and to, to uh, come over it to do that uh, at ease, and to be able to do that, they said they are insects, they are rats, they are, that's life which isn't worth to live. And uh, therefore, in this sense, the human centipede is a picture for fascistic, fascistic ideo ideology, which tries, or racism, uh, a point of view to separate human beings into groups and to say this group isn't worth as much as the other group and I, I'm allowed to kill them. In this sense, there is a strong, there is a strong political message behind the, the the image of the human centipede to treat other peoples as lower, uh, as of lower value or uh, not as human beings. And therefore, all three films, that's a, a very strong message in all three films. I thought that was uh, perfectly well put because if you think of someone less than human, that it does, there's no really repercussions to what uh, what you would happen to do with them. And um, what was uh, what was Eric Roberts like on set? Because uh, I thought you guys really had a lot of great interaction uh, when you guys had scenes together. Eric Roberts, yes, I loved him because I I knew for, for sure I knew him before we met and. Oh, I, I said to him, when, when we met first, I said to him, great honor to meet you because I'm a fan of Eric Roberts. I always have been. Uh, I, uh, I love, I love uh, all what I have seen f from him. And uh, we, in a couple of hours, we became friends. And we had a wonderful time together. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes during the shoot, when we had, had to wait, I switched off my character and we had some uh, nice talks together about film, about art, about uh, our lives and so on. 
So I, I like him very much, and uh, it was easy and uh, very comfortable to work together with him mm -hmm. because he's such a good actor. And uh, sometimes we, we had, after a scene, we had a short hug together, and uh, mm, he trusted me uh, very much because he very early uh, checked that If I say, oh, that was a great scene or great moment, uh, that, that I never lie. Uh, and that's uh, true. So when I said to Eric after a, a shot, uh, Eric, that was great, then he trusted me and then he enjoyed it. And therefore, we, we liked each other very much. Yeah. Now... Um, I don't know, since you're in Germany, I don't know if you're, you know, how aware you are of after the first one came out and they would uh, reference it on uh, South Park and on uh, TV shows. And uh, were you aware of all that? And like, did that surprise you that, you know, this kind of underground film started to get a lot of mainstream attention where they would parody it or they would reference it on, you know, mainstream television? Right. I uh, no, I never have thought about that because, as, as I uh, repeat, repeating the sentence, uh, never looking left or right. Mm -hmm. uh, the only hint was uh, during the shoot of uh, part one, uh, some technicians uh, mumbled and uh, said to me, "Peter, you will be called," and uh, I only. Mm, took it as a nice encouragement and uh, support, uh, but that it really happened that Dr. Heide would become cult one day, I never ever thought thought that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, but that's, uh, as I said, that's not the motivation, it's uh, mm -hmm. just a nice thing if it happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bert Lancaster sometimes often said to me during our work, uh, Dieter, mm, my best films you never have seen because they didn't make it to Europe. And vice versa, I can say, mm, Neil and Annabelle, uh, my, a couple of my best films you never have and never will see because they didn't make it to America. And uh, I don't want to compare myself with Bert Lancaster, but uh, I love that idea that uh, mm, you can do anything about it, how, in which amount or uh, how strongly your work is recognized. Mm -hmm. That's um, luck or bad luck or whatever. What are a couple of the films? Because the, with the internet, if someone wanted to seek out the, your best films, what would you say they are? Uh, huh. For me, is every part, the moment I do it, the center of the world. So the last part is the most important, and that's at the moment, Bill Boss. On the other hand, I can say, My very first uh, part for the cinema, the title role in John Glück's stuff is, I think, must be, should be, I don't know, I haven't seen it since decades, uh, must be a good film because I immediately won the German Film Award in gold for, for that first work uh, at the cinema. Um, but, mm, you know, To be honest, I never ever look my own films. I don't, I even don't collect them. I don't have pictures at home or critics, nothing. I'm only looking forward. And uh, you have to, to, to beat me to watch old films of mine. What was the movie or set of movies Tom Six had seen of you that made him want you? Uh, that was a German movie uh, for the cinema, which uh, in which I played uh, a mass murderer in a prison. Not a very 
if I, I got a big fight with the director of that film because he treated his, his young leading part so badly. And this director cut it out every possible moment of my part. So what Tom saw in that film, uh, which is called Führer X, is a, a small part because uh, I was cut, cut out as much as possible. And anyway, he could see, uh, or he liked it as much that he said, that will be my leading actor. And he, they made contact with me. Ilona wrote a mail and we met in Berlin. And I thought, okay, that's an audition. I will meet a lot of my uh, esteemed co colleagues if, of German actors. But in the lobby of the Hilton Berlin, there were only one beautiful couple. I thought it's a couple, but it's, I learned it's a brother and sister waiting there. And they came from Amsterdam. They flew in only to talk to me and offer me the part because Tom said, I want this man and nothing else. And it worked very fast. He, he told me the story brilliantly. I jumped up. I said, I love your passion. Ah, uh, I love uh, your competence. And uh, let's do it. And five minutes later, I had me and Ilona had, an, had a deal by handshake. That's the story. And... Uh, you know, <laughs> during the shoot of that movie, the German movie Führer X, I one day said to the director in front of the whole staff and the whole, whole producer, everything, all actors were there. And I used that moment and I said to the director, you know, you are a very bad director. <laughs> and he flushed. <laughs> And he said, what, 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 what you are talking about? And I said, you are a very, very bad director because every morning you take your bad mood and hit it on the head of your young actor. He is coming freshly out of drama school and you mm, play power games and treat him badly. And therefore, you are a bad director. And he said, I stop uh, working with you anymore. Every other scene which will have to be done with Dieter Laser will uh, do the first assistant director. And he, <laughs> he, I played the part uh, to, to the end uh, only with the assistant director. And then at the, at the editing table, this director cut me out. But nevertheless, uh, the rest was impressive enough for Tom Six to cast me. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like being so outspoken and honest has helped? Obviously, people could say, well, that would hurt you. But do you think it's helped you establish that you're, when you do something, you're going to do it all the way and believe in what you're doing? And it's a sense of integrity. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's a gift by the genes. I, uh, I have one gift of God or the heaven or from, from, uh, from hell, whoever gave it to me. It is that I had never, until now, from the scratch, I had never a fear of existence. I never uh, was anxious about money or food or, or career or something like that. And I, that's a gift which is, makes you, gives you all, also trouble, but uh, it's also a strength. It's both, it's good and bad as well. Um, I did that from beginning. I never cared. And uh, when I started at the theater, I, as with 18 years old, uh, I sometimes went into the management and said, uh, you can do what you will, you can punish me, you can uh, give me to send me to prison, I won't play this part. And they said, you have a contract, and they said, uh, I won't do it. So call the police. And uh, sometimes I came through with that, sometimes I left the, the theater and had no jobs and something like that. Uh, but uh, I'm thankful for that because uh, I learned very early 
only to do things which I love to do. And I even lost a lot of money sometimes by saying no. But that is true. That strengthens, gives you power over the years when you are trained only to do what you love to do. Speaking of training, I believe you'd said that you learned as you went. Did you have any formal acting training in a school or in a classroom? No. No. I, on, a, on a cold winter afternoon, I think I was 16 years old, uh, I went to the most, because you have to know that I was educated in a Christian uh, sect. There was forbidden to watch films, to read literature, to read the newspaper. There was only praying three times a day. And the powerful language of the Bible, that uh, created my love for literature. And the love for literature created my love for the theater. And I think I was 14 or 15 years old when I first time in my life was in a theater. And I was trembling wow. as a believer and brainwashed young man. I was trembling on my whole body because uh, that was devil's work. That was uh, the worst place. It was going like into to a, a whorehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I thought, oh, if now the building is breaking down, I will come directly into hell. And uh, but the love to the, to the arts was so strong that I said, mm -hmm, no, I will I will become an actor. So I made a deal with the devil. I said, because what shall you do if you are brainwashed and you are believing? So I said, uh, okay, uh, I will become an actor and I will pay in her hell. But uh, the devil has has to help me to become an actor for that. And I went on a winter afternoon to the most famous theater in Germany and asked the doorman how to become an actor, because my education, I didn't know how, how you become an actor. And he said, there's an extra missing for the fairy tale afternoon show for children, because it was December. And uh, he said, there's an extra missing up in the, into the third floor. There's a big hall for the extras. There you will get your dress. And half an hour later, I stood with a bunch of so-called sailors on stage. And uh, that was the big start of my big career as an extra. <laughs> and uh, it happened that... Uh, Mm, I, 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 they kept me as an extra and uh, different uh, tasks. And one day, let's say after half a year later, I became one word in in uh, a play. Then I became two words. Then a little sentence. Then a little part. Then another little part. And one day, they called me up to the management and said, "Here's a contract." And you now are allowed to sit with the, in my opinion, the gods, with the real actors in the same con conversation room, and you get a real wardrobe. And overnight, my dream had become true. I was suddenly I was an actor, and uh, then I uh, I uh, stayed 14 years only on stage, but different theaters. And uh, then I became the, uh, later on, after 10 years on stage, I became one of the co-founders of the still now most famous German theater, the Schaubühne in Berlin. And I was member of the board there. And uh, after we had founded that four years later, I suddenly decided to become a freelancer. And I started film work, and then I got my first film work. Uh, you said you started this very early, that you were 16 when you went in for your first part. And then telling us that you've come from this intense Christian sect, what was the, what was the consequence of that in your home life? Oh, I escaped home three times, was brought back by police, 
And the third time I said to my mother, if once again I will be picked up by the police and brought home, I will leave the country, I will go to Spain or Italy or France, wherever, and you will never ever see me again in your whole life. And that made me, then they left me. And I, uh, I lived uh, the first time as an extra. I earned so little money that at night I worked at a hotel boy, at a call boy, a uh, uh, bell boy in a hotel. And uh, in the evening I did my job as, as extra. And on daytime I slept or went to rehearsal to rehearsals as an extra, and uh, until I really became, indeed became an actor. Did your mother ever accept you uh, being an actor? Never, because that was devil's work, and she never ever accepted that. And, uh, yeah, but I accepted that? that she not accepted that, so we, uh, I had very little contact with her. The whole, the whole lifetime since then. Was that common for other actors in that age group? Oh no, that's quite that's seldom because because you know the population of of the sex is not so big. That's quite seldom. Uh, even in that in that fierce form. Even at that time, that wasn't a common thing. Yeah, absolutely, it was exceptional. In that time. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you lucked out. Yeah, but I was lucky lucky enough to escape that sect. Because, you know, it, it's very tough at that young age to uh, get rid of that uh, uh, education. Because you believe in God. You believe in Jesus. You believe in hell and heaven. And uh, to do the contrary, to, to say, okay, I, I will do all that forbidden stuff. Uh, that takes a lot of, of psych, psyche power because it, it's not easy, you know, at, at that age. Later on, when you have learned a lot, uh, and then you gain confidence and then you see uh, you have other perspectives. But the first step uh, to that is, is quite tough. Mm -hmm. Did, was that hard for you, though, in life, that your mother didn't accept what you wanted to do or... To be rejected all the time, even though she she didn't mean it bad, but she just believed what she believed. Uh, mm, I think then you say that's not love. Uh, even if the love to God is, in her opinion, more important, that's not love to a child. And I decided uh, mm, if I would have children. Uh, even if they would do the birth. So that's not the idea of a mother, mm -hmm. that you are able to say, I'm not interested because you are living uh, in, a, in a world of sin. And uh, therefore, I cut that feeling uh, out. And uh, I, I started to feel about my mother like a, foreign, in a str stranger or a foreign uh, person. Uh, and that made it quite easy for me, mm -hmm. because um, my anyway I was so uh, in love with my art that I didn't care a lot. Yeah, and it would have been something that happened over time where you just finally decided, this is it. I'm out. I'm gone. Uh, I'm I'm gone, and uh, then you do in your life you do, uh, let's say two or three approaches or tests how the situation is and when you discover the same as before um, then you take, take the consequences and say okay it's like losing like losing a friend yeah. um, do you feel that that's helped you as an actor to have that background and to have that experience of that uh, great I think difficulty that helped yeah I think let let's say the, it it enforces the the passion. It enhances the passion. How different are um, your movie, uh, the Human Centipede films, to a German 
uh, audience as opposed to uh, in America. Is there a big difference? I don't think so. Uh, I don't. Uh, I I really don't know because I I only have seen uh, centipede one once in Brussels and once uh, in the, at the London premiere, and never ever have seen it again since then. As I told you, I I never look at uh, uh, at older films of mine and. Therefore, I don't know. I only know the reactions by mail, by Facebook, by mm -hmm. by um, Twitter, and so on. But and sometimes in Germany, sometimes it happens on the street. Tourists from other countries, from Israel or what, wherever, uh, they suddenly cry on the street. Oh, are you Dr. Heiter? And I say yes, and they. Uh, ask, may I have a picture? That's the same uh, photo. That's the same in the States or in Great Britain or where, wherever. Uh, we actually did have kind of a joint question we wanted to ask you to uh, together. It's because uh, we discuss these movies a lot, and um, it's about uh, the last scene you have with Dwight. And um, yeah, we have different uh, view on it. Um, uh, do you want to say what we think of it, Annabelle, and ask him? Uh... Sure. All right. So uh, this is just for our audience. This is a massive spoiler. So give us maybe five, three, five minutes. Yeah, just close your ears and then for come a back uh -huh. because this is a big deal. All mm -hmm. right. So in the very last scene with the two of you, and you, Dwight says that was my idea, and you congratulate him and start to give him credit and then Dwight has no idea what's coming to him he dies with a smile on his face do you feel that the Bill Boss character wanted him to feel good in his last moments or do you feel it was more of a power play where he had satisfaction from tricking Dwight it's more a very mean technical trick to keep your victim calm so that you can kill him without big trouble or noise or blood uh, or everything. To get uh, the, mo the most easiest way to, to uh, kill him uh, without get, uh, having trouble. So, so it's the meanness is uh, I tried to, to be as convincing as possible for him by telling him, yeah, you are so right. I'm sad because uh, I'm sorry and uh, you will get everything and blah, 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 and kill him. Uh, it's it's uh, a disguise. It's, uh, it's a disguise, but the thing is, Mm, that I think I'm convinced if you as mean evil character or creature like the hunting creatures mm, they have the best tricks to f make you feel safe and that's what he does and that means he is able to come quite close to that feeling but the consequence, he is creating that feeling. I, if I think about that scene, I remember that uh, in a normal way, the emotion which I created in myself were true. But the consequence, the using of it, is shooting him. So I tell a girl, you are the best in the world. I love you so much. And uh, you are my jewel, and you are bop, 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 and talking, talking, talking. You believe it, and therefore she can believe you. But then she, you will rape her as a mean person. And that's the mean game is to get as close to a real emotion as possible, but use it in a contrary way in the country and in a bad and mean way. That's evil. That's the real evil. 
There you go, so, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I had said so, this to uh, Neil. Yeah. I, I feel that I feel that Dr. Heiter, for example, has has some some compassion with his victims, but that doesn't hinder him him uh, to treat uh, to to uh, how he treats them, and that's a kind of fascism or racism or whatever. Yeah, because he sees these people really as pets, whereas Bill Boss just sees victims. Yeah. I didn't want to also ask, uh, as you brought up several times as Alona, and um, obviously Tom is is really more visible. He's out there a lot. But how important is Alona to, uh, to these films? Oh, she's very important. She is... Uh, a wonderful producer because she understands uh, to create a climate and a surrounding and conditions uh, where the actors feel comfortable, where the atmosphere is great, where the working relationship between the different compartments is beautifully uh, constructed and uh, She's together with, with Tom. They are an ideal task force. Uh, they do both a wonderful job and uh, working wonderfully together. Now, um, so, I, I also liked uh, in, in part three how uh, they gave the inmates uh, lines that were actually from actual um, reviews of the movie. Like, uh, Aki actually says a yeah. line from uh, the Roger Ebert review of, of the original film. And yeah. I thought I thought that was great. And just, um, I know you talked briefly earlier about uh, about critics. Um, has any of anyone's uh, reviews of either of the films ever bothered you? And how much do you really pay attention to reviews? Uh let's say I, I, I read them. And uh, I'm I'm pretty cool about it. If, as I said, if they are good, I'm I'm glad. If they are not good, uh, I think it over. Is it, there's something to learn about it, uh, and then I for, forget it. And uh, more important is for me the audience, how the audience reacts. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm, very in my whole career, uh, there's seldom. There are seldom critics uh, where you can learn something from. Uh, sometimes in the theater it had happened that guys who were very, very professional who could tell you in a critic what, what you could do better. But uh, I think nowadays uh, I don't care very, very much because mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's an inflation of meaning and uh, and, um, yeah, sometimes you are lucky, people like it. I, I was proud when, when I read something about uh, Dr. Heiter compared with uh, Hannibal Lecter, and I said, okay, uh, that's a great honor. And uh, mm, I think if people say, well, boss, yeah, if the, the critics are bad, I don't care because... Uh, most important for me is my director. And even if I would think uh, to do it another way, I never would cheat. I do what we both think is best. And I never ever think uh, how would critics react? Because uh, if you are not totally stupid, you can assume that these kind of films can easily get very bad critics. <laughs> That's no wonder if you do that stuff in the way we are doing it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, you know, really caring about what uh, the audience for these movies think more than what, you know, a critic might think for the movie. Uh, what Are you surprised by, uh, by your audience for these films? As, like, meaning... Um, like the age range, what what is the typical audience for the Human Centipede movies? Is it a certain age range, or is it really all different kinds of people? It, it, it's all different kinds of people, and the the the, the wonderful thing is, 
um, I, in a way, I have the feeling that they much more easier and much. Uh, mm, they have no problems to to see the cartoonish uh, style, the ca- comedy script, the black comedy in it. They um, they have no problems, and uh, mm, the reactions are mostly between if one or two a couple of people start to giggle then the roller coaster starts uh-huh. then the whole uh, audience in the cinema starts uh, to laugh then they are shocked and the laughing stops and then again they laugh again and they so they drive through the the great art of tom is to combine uh, thriller elements, comedy elements, and horror elements to one film, and therefore it's a, it's a, a nice, nice up and down, uh, back and forth, and a laughter and sh- uh, horror and shock, uh, and this mixture is very singular, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, I do want to exceptional. I do have to bring something up. Uh, a lot of our audience knows this, and I'm not. Sh- I know I've told you this once uh, a few years ago, but I want to say it while you're here. And actually, Annabelle and I uh, would not have known each other and not have met and not have done our videos together if it wasn't for Human Centipede and specifically yourself, because Annabelle did a painting of you. I commented on the painting and said, "Hey, I just interviewed uh, Dieter. Uh, like, it was probably a few months ago, and I shared that uh, with her. And that's actually how we became friends and decided to meet each other in the first place. Was uh, through these movies and, and through yourself." Oh, great, great. So I don't know if you should take credit for that or if you should apologize <laughs> to everybody. For that. Um? <laughs> For, uh, bring this <laughs> no, I take credit for it. <laughs> it yeah. is interesting That's because uh, I obviously I love the first movie, and since then I've I've really come to respect Tom and all you guys so much. He's so. Uh, this is me just going to compliment Tom and you guys excessively, but he is so unique, and he's yeah. not afraid of anything, and he'll take whatever the world gives him. And just yeah. feeds from it and plays with it and just goes and goes and goes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's it's wonderful. And therefore, it's so, so great to work with them. I think this is a nice way to uh, wrap this up. It's been about two hours. And uh, oh, yeah. it's, it's been wonderful to talk to you, Dieter. And uh, we really yes. appreciate being on here tonight. Neil, make the best out of it that you can't that you would say that's a native speaker, mm-hmm. this man. So cut out every shit. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't, we won't get someone to dub over your voice. It, it was, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, you, you can do that for me. <laughs> you, say, you go in between and say he means, uh, that's what he meant. <laughs> uh, yeah. Audio subtitles. Okay. No, no. Thank you very much for for that wonderful talking to you. You know, I was so afraid to do it. Therefore, I said, I, I, and I think I will stop uh, phone uh, interviews. But you rem- reminded me. Therefore, I said, okay, since I have met you now in life in L.A. And uh, you are so nice personalities and guys. Uh, that I said, okay, I will do it the last time. But I think in the future, I only do written interviews or uh, in front of camera or something like that. But uh, as I said, I trust you. And uh, maybe you can be proud that this really was my last phone interview. It, it wow. means so a lot. Can... Yeah, it means a lot that you came on at all, but uh, that makes it even more special. And I really do appreciate that you decided to do it. Yes, the... thank you, Neil. It's Thank you, Annabelle. One. Yeah, of course. I was going to say yes. it's the last one until you come back to us. <laughs> I'll say okay. next next time we meet. <laughs> next time we meet, I'll make sure to bring a camera along, and then we'll we'll get it on video. Yeah, we do it live in uh, next premiere. Uh-huh. You have a camera with you, and we do a live interview. Perfect. That sounds great. Yeah. I'm going to keep that hey. audio bit and remind you. I'll say, hey, I have it right okay. here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. No Bye-bye. Take care. Take care as well. Bye. Thank you.
Hey, what's up, folks? This is Carlos Ramirez, and you are listening to Without Your Head. Who needs a head when you got your ears to listen?